Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to SOAS. Um, welcome you to the second Bangabadu Sheikh Wajibur Rahman lecture, uh, 2019. This year, the lecture is going to be delivered by Professor Sohela Nazneen, who is a fellow of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. Uh, she's also a professor of international relations in the University of Dakar, but on leave. My name is Edward Simpson, and I'm the director of the South Asia Institute here at SOAS. And in that capacity, I represent the 80 or so academics who work at SOAS, who research, write, uh, and think about South Asian themes. I also get to represent SOAS in South Asia, and to think about partnerships with interesting uh, strategic organisations. So it's with some pleasure that we've paired up with the 7th of March Foundation uh, to bring you this lecture. This is the second in what we hope to be a much longer series where we bring a spotlight onto Bangladesh to think about Bangladesh in a South Asian context and I suppose quite frankly to promote Bangladesh studies uh, in a region that, as many of you will know, is dominated by the study of that large country, uh, the diamond-shaped one in the middle of South Asia. So Professor Nazneen holds a PhD in Development Studies, which is also from IDS, uh, and a master's degree from the same institution. And her research has focused in many ways on gender, equality, empowerment, and development. But along the way, she's also asked questions about where genealogies of feminism have come from uh, in the West and in the region. She's also asked intriguing questions about the relationship between political society, empowerment, and metrics, or ways of thinking about development. So there are different axes that run through her work relating to women's identity and empowerment particularly in the region. So it's with some pleasure uh, that I give the floor to Professor Nazneen. Before I do, I just want to say something about the way the evening will run. I have currently finished my introduction. The lecture will last 45 to 50 minutes um, and we will have a reception afterwards to which you are all cordially invited. The only slightly difficult logistic thing is that the reception is not in this building. So uh, you will be guided from here back to, uh, well, I've just come from there, you'll be going there, to the Brunei Gallery, which is the adjacent building where we'll, we'll have tea and cake, uh, to which I'll encourage you all to come and to ask questions of our lecturers <laughs> if you have them. So, Professor Nesni, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Edward. And uh, thanks to the 7th Mar March Foundation and also SOAS for inviting me to give this lecture. It's an honor and a privilege to be here, particularly because it's 7th of March. And those of you know Bangladesh's history, then you also know that um, our founding father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, gave his speech on this day that sort of sows the seed of our independence. Um, having said that, uh, let's move on to the business of uh, today. Um, so I'm talking about contentious empowerment, looking at women as agents of uh, change. I talk very fast, so feel free to stop me if you need to, if you don't get something. Um, I'm not very formal in terms of how formal annual lectures are done, so I won't mind. Uh, well, how we are framing this lecture is as Bangladesh, as you know, if you look at the social development indicators, so whether you look at girls' uh, enrollment in primary education or secondary education, or if you look at maternal mortality, or if you look at um, fertility rate dropping. You know, in terms of, if you look at where Bangladesh started from and where it is now, it's been lauded for these kind of gains. And it did quite well comparatively if you look at the South Asian region itself. Um, so there's been a lot of praise recently for Bangladesh in terms of doing well, in, not just only in social development, but also talking about women's empowerment itself and the role that women have played in development, the role that Bangladesh government has done in terms of the different policies it has taken over the years, different regimes. 
So that's how Bangladesh is portrayed a lot in sort of the development studies um, sort of um, literature, if you see. So I'm from development studies, that's why I'm picking up on it. But there are also contradictory images of women, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Why do I say contradictory? Because a lot of the time you talk about women's empowerment, you, you loud the different policies that's been taken um, and things that has happened, the changes. But there are also stereotypical portrayal of women, and I'll come to the stereotypes a little bit later. So there are these contradictory images, and why are they there? And then there's also the larger development narrative in terms of how development happened in Bangladesh. Who were the key actors? Um, what made the changes happen? And in that larger narrative, a lot of the time, we don't actually see women as actors or women as agents of change. And the focus of this lecture is actually on that, not just looking at how ordinary women change things, but I research quite a lot on movements and collective struggles, so I will be talking quite a bit about women's movement in Bangladesh and how they're an actor for change. And then sort of try to look at, well, these changes have happened, but how may the future pan out? And what are the challenges for us in the future? As a sort of, as a country as a whole, but also for women of Bangladesh who play a critical role in this uh, change process. So just to give you quickly, uh, that's the structure of the lecture. I'll give you a little bit of the context, where we started from, what has happened. I'll talk about women's movement's achievements, and then I'll talk about the challenges in the future. So that's what we are doing. And I'll show you plenty of pictures, because it's always fun to look at visual stuff. So let's start with why look at women as agents of change. So I talked about women being uh, portrayed as a, in a stereotypical manner when you look at the literature on Bangladesh. And look at cultural studies literature also on Bangladesh. A lot of them focuses on women in a particular way. So you will see sort of if you look at the literature from 70s, 80s, even 90s, or even now, uh, there's a lot of focus on there are lots of poor women in Bangladesh who are uh, deprived, who don't have agent, much of an agency, who are suffering. So you see those kind of portrayal. You also see portrayal of uh, women in a particular way, for example, women microcredit borrowers. You all know about Grameen Bank and BRAC and all the large development NGOs that run credit programs. So you see them as credit recipients, sort of entrepreneurs, right? You, there's a lot of discussion, if you are familiar with social protection literature, so a lot of discussion on how female-headed households have been targeted. Uh, by the government in a particular way, what are they doing? Again, deserving women, right? Uh, poor women who deserve our help. Or you, all of you are probably familiar with the garment industry and women workers in the garment industry and how they're exploited, et cetera, et cetera, which is of course true, but then there's also other side of it which we need to look at. So a lot of the focus then goes on to what is the nature of um, the economic system, the cap capital capitalism that's burgeoning in Bangladesh, how does that affect women, but also looking at particular patriarchal structures. And because Bangladesh is a Muslim majority country, there's always that reading. A lot of the time when you talk about women's rights or when you talk about the situation of women, a um, lot of surprises from people sort of saying, oh, but I thought it was a Muslim majority country. Yes, it is, but not all Muslim majority countries are alike. So there's, there are these notions and assumptions about women and about Bangladesh. Um, there's, of course, also in the cultural studies literature and also in, in our own national kind of uh, production of literature, talking about women as symbols, symbols of cultural change, symbols of nationalist movement, um, you know, nation as the mother. We all know all, all, all that kind of the narrative that, that's built up. So you see women portrayed in lots of different ways, and all of these are a particular, uses a particular lens in terms of what you want to portray. And the reality is somewhere in between. Uh, women are not, not all women are deprived and exploited. Women are not devoid of agency, and um, neither, uh, I mean, of course there's patriarchy, but then women are challenging patriarchy in a particular way. So we need to look at all those aspects. So that's why it's, neat, it's important to look at the agency aspect as you look at structure itself. But then I'm at SOAS, so all of you are familiar with structure and agency debate, right? Um, so let's look at the Bangladesh context. So the context, basically, I always say it has three Ps. 
Uh, why? Because it's patrilineal, so the descent in Bangladesh in terms of family um, sort of descent is through the father. Uh, it's patrilocal, so if you're a woman marrying, uh, and in Bangladesh it's a very heteronormative marriage, that's the only kind of marriage that's recognized, you will be relocating to your husband's village or your husband's house. That's what's going to happen. That's why it's patrilocal. And obviously it's patriarchal. Um, some of you are familiar with Naila Kabir's work, which uh, basically terms this region, South Asia and Middle East and North Africa, as a classic patriarchy. So what it means is that there is a, an ideology of uh, female dependence, economic dependence. If you look at the property system, the way it, the inheritance system, um, it constructs that kind of dependency. And uh, there is also um, sort of a culture of segregation. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're physically secluded. It's sort of, you have um, sort of, there, there are lots of social norms and values and the way your mobility is controlled and who you interact with outside the household is controlled in terms of people who are not related to you by blood or through marriage, so not in your kin, is quite controlled. Uh, that doesn't necessarily apply to women in urban areas, mostly, or women who are working, but think about small villages, remote villages. A lot of the time, that is how your um, interactions are constructed in terms of your extra household relations. That's, what, that's, that's a sort of a symptom of um, classic patriarchy. That's why it's Bangladesh is being boxed in, in line with uh, the other countries in that region. So there's a need to think a lot of the time when I say this and then I hear, but that's not true in my family. I come from a middle class family or I live in Dhaka city. That's not what I experience. Yes, but that's not necessarily applies to all Bangladeshi women, right? So you need to think about when you're thinking about typical Bangladeshi girls, um, most of them would be married off. About 66% of our girls are married off by the time they're 16. You really relocate to your husband's village. Uh, you, your kin and family members are not there. What does that mean for you? Being in a completely different place, away from your family, married off. Yes, your in-laws may be kind, but what does that mean for your life chances in terms of going to school, getting a degree, going for work? You know, your agency. So you need to think about that context when you think about then when we talk about women as agents of change and what they have done, you, have, you need to think where they're starting from, right? Um, so let's still talk about the Bangladesh context. I'm trying to give you a general picture of Bangladesh. So women's condition and status, if you look at the pictures from 1970s and if you look at what it is now, it has changed dramatically. So that's a dramatic shift that I was talking about. And uh, you know that UNDP does this ranking in terms of gender development index. So Bangladesh ranks as the 134th country. That's the, basically the stats in 2018. Um, and there are 197 countries, right? Um, if you look at constitution and try to look at what's in the law, constitution guarantees equal rights for women, but that's only in the public sphere. That's not in the private sphere, and I'll come to that, what I mean by private. Uh, we are signatory to the UN uh, convention that's on convention and elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, the CEDAW. Uh, we signed it um, in 1979 when it came out. We ratified it in 1980, so we are one of the countries that did it actually right at the beginning. Uh, what is the trick here is that there is a reservation that's placed by the Bangladesh government on Article 2. And what Article 2 of CEDO uh, talks about is about uh, ensuring that your legal system and all your other systems are in line uh, to ensure gender equality in all spheres, right? Um, so remember I talked about private sphere? So this is where private sphere comes in. Because our family laws are, so laws related to marriage, uh, divorce, inheritance, custody, guardianship, everything that you can think about is governed by religious personal law. So this is something that was um, sort of in a way codified. It's not that it didn't exist, but in the form that it exists now happened during the colonial times. And it's not that things haven't been reformed, they have. 
But it, what it does is basically, depending on your religion, uh, that particular law would apply to you. So if you're a Muslim, obviously, um, it's Sharia, which would apply to you in these matters. Please don't confuse it with like civil or criminal matters. Our civil or criminal matters, Sharia doesn't apply. It's only in the personal case. So if you're a Hindu, it's the Hindu sort of uh, code that would apply. If you're a Christian, then obviously, if you're Anglican and Catholic, depending on who, what you are, that's what would apply. Uh, and basically, as with all religious personal laws, they don't necessarily treat men and women equally. So there's a problem. And uh, it's difficult to, as I said, some of these have been reformed, um, but not necessarily all of it. So there's still biases within the law. And I'm happy to take questions later if you have specific questions about what it is like, etc. Uh, we do have a women's ministry, which was uh, established in 1979 and which has been functioning quite well. So then that means there are specific machineries within the government that looks after um, women's affairs and gender issues inside the government and also how things are being implemented. Um, in terms of social development itself, remember I said the pace has been quite fast. So if you look at the statistics in the 70s and where Bangladesh started from, and how it improved. The pace has been amazing in that sense. Um, and also in terms of attitude, I mean, surveys, obviously, you take it with a pinch and a grain of salt because uh, surveys don't always reflect what people think. People might just tell you what they think. Uh, so this is a 2011 survey where 74% uh, said, and it was a nationally representative sample, said that they believe in equal rights for women. Now, they might have been saying it just because that was the politically correct thing to say. Um, but my point would be, in 2011, at least they thought it was politically correct to say it. If you did the survey in, I don't know, 1979 or 1989, I'm sure they would not have thought about that that's the politically correct thing to say. So there is sort of this notion that equal rights is an important thing. And maybe if you're not for it, you shouldn't really be saying that. So. Uh, there it is. In terms of health and education, because I talked about social indicators, so that's why you look at health and education quite a lot. Uh, these are a little bit old statistics, but I wanted to put it there to show you the change. So if you look at um, sort of maternal mortality, so look at what it was in 1986 and look at what it is in 2001. So it, from 86 to 2001, you could half it. It reduces by half. That's an amazing pace for any country. And for Bangladesh, think about in the 80s. I mean, right now, we are economically growing at a really fast pace, 7.8% annually. Fantastic. But that's not what it was in the 1980s or even in the 1990s. Our growth was just accelerating. We were still a donor-dependent country in the 80s and 90s. To think about what kind of investment went in there and the policies that were being taken and being implemented to be able to do that. Um, our population control programs are very well known. Those of you who do demographic studies would definitely know that. Uh, so in the 70s, it was 7.4 kids on average. That's the fertility rate for women. Look at the rate in 2007, which is uh, 2.7. Right now, it's 2.3. It is, um, I mean, of course, we can talk about reproductive choices. Um, sort of what was the sort of the was there an instrumental kind of logic behind trying to control population? Yes, definitely, because our country, if you know, have seen it on the map, it's very tiny, and we, there are lots of people in Bangladesh, right? Uh, almost 160 million. Um, so in that sense, there was an impetus for the government to run and focus on population control. But it's the way the program was structured. So this is the first time you start seeing women community health workers coming out in the 70s to go in the communities to talk about contraception, to sort of provide access to contraception. It, it is for a patriarchal country in the 1970s where we were starting from. It's a revolutionary idea in, at that time. 
Um, you also had to like not just convince the women to use contraception. You kind of had to deal with the men to get in because the men really didn't want you around. You had to convince the local clerics that this was population control was a good thing, you know. And uh, we did it quite well, actually. Uh, look at education. So in terms of education, if you look at 1970s stats, we don't do very well. There's a high level of Ill, at that time, uh, illiteracy among women. Right now, for adult women, the percentage is 49.5. But what it has been amazing is that since 1990s, we have managed to get girls in school, and we reached gender parity long before, in primary education, long before MDGs became fashionable, and uh, there was all talk about getting girls in school. And now we have almost have parity in secondary education. So it's been fantastic. And that's also partly because of the kind of innovative sort of programming that happened and policy changes. So we had something called secondary uh, school stipend um, that raised, uh, that targeted sort of girls because girls were dropping out after primary and they were not continuing their education. So it targeted girls um, and to keep girls in school. But you could only get that stipend if you were coming to school and attending school. So it's been amazing in terms of enrollment. Are there problems? Yes, because remember I said girls get married by the time they're 16, 66% of the girls. So yes, I mean, if you look at stats for child marriage, um, it used to be 12-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls, so the age has gone up a little, but you would want to keep the girls in school longer, right? to finish their degrees. So that's the challenge. The dropout rate towards the end of the secondary education, completion of the secondary education, that's our challenge right now. So let me give you a little bit more of the context. This is just giving you what it's like, the whole picture. So in terms of politics, um, we don't do that badly. Uh, the global average for um, representation of women in parliament is 22%. Uh, ours is 20.3, so that's not bad. We ha do have a gender quota in the parliament, so there are 50 reserved seats. Obviously, that bumps up your representation, right? Um, in the local government, we also have quota or reserve seats. So one third of the seats are reserved for women. So a, a ward would have about uh, one chair, and a, you have one chair, and then you have representatives, right? Um, and uh, basically the general seats, generally you see men running. It's not that women don't run in those seats, but you have three reserve seats in each ward. So then it, it bumps up your representation rate, right? And in terms of if you look at the number of wards and then if you look at absolute numbers, that's 24,000 women coming into office, you know, when local elections are run. So that's not bad. You know, in terms of number, it's not bad. Those of you who know a little bit about Bangladesh, you know that we have had a female prime minister where, since 1991. It's been either Sheikh Hasina or Khaled Azia, whoever has won the election and has been in power. We did have a little bit uh, of time as caretaker government regime in um, sort of uh, 2007 and 8, but that's only brief break for two years. So we have had a female prime minister since 1991. That's quite a feat for any country. Right now we have a female speaker. We have had women ministers, quite a few of them in the last few terms ever since sort of democracy returned. So that's not necessarily bad compared to a lot of countries where people would have trouble to show women in the cabinet or women as speakers or women as heads of government. Um, so you're not doing badly. There are different, there are questions there, of course, in terms of you might say, okay, you have quotas for parliamentarians and you have quotas for local government. How effective are the women when they go into power? Whether are they able to promote uh, women's interests or not in these spaces? So obviously there are questions around that. But in terms of just presence of women, that's not a bad thing. Uh, let's look at work. So currently the labor force participation is 33% which of course we would like it to be higher, but sadly that's not what it is. In urban areas, obviously a lot of you know about the garment sector, so we do have a lot of women working in the ready-made garment sectors. There are also informal sectors where women work. I can show you lovely pictures that I have. The bureaucracy has about a 15% quota for women. 
um, the quota hasn't been necessarily fulfilled. Uh, there's, we still lag behind. Uh, so, you know, not all like government official posts then get, gets filled. Uh, but in primary education, obviously, a lot of our primary teachers, almost 60% are women, uh, health workers. A lot of women work in, in the health sector, particularly nursing. I mean, if you look at government hospitals and uh, sort of the community health centers and other centers. Um, so it's not a bad picture in that sense. Uh, in terms of, you asked me about gender wage gap, uh, the wage gap is definitely there. Uh, it's not equal for men and women, um, but it is narrowing down for professional jobs. But you know, if you say, well, what's happening with agricultural laborers? What happens in that market? Difficult, you know, thing to sort of, or like in the informal sector where you can't really regulate, uh, it becomes difficult, of course. In rural areas, you see a lot of women working in agriculture and lots of home-based kind of production, so cottage in industries, kitchen gardens, and things like that, poultry, a big area. You do see poor women working in public works program, and it is particularly targeted towards women, female-headed households, women who have been divorced or abandoned or don't um, have male support. So the targeting criteria actually then tries to select women from those groups. And of course, you know, all know about our microcredit program, which is um, quite successful. And we can talk about the problems of credit um, afterwards. But the majority of the borrowers are women. Credit programs uh, run by NGOs and government do target women and promote uh, women's borrowing. Having said that, I'm giving you lots of rosy facts, but then there are also stuff or challenges that we haven't been able to really adequately address as of yet. So this is a 2007 survey, but I can also give you the recent figures. Uh, this is about ever married women, so women who have been ever married. Um, and it's about physical violence. So you can see it's 49%. And in Bangladesh, marriage is universal. Remember, most women do get married. You know, that's how it is. That's how society runs. You, you do see single women or widowed women, but generally, women get married. Um, and 49% uh, is quite high, if you think about it. Um, but then there are also attitude surveys. So you can see in that attitude survey, the same one I talked about, which said 74% thought you know, women should have equal rights. This one says that 55% thought that violence against women under any condition, particularly domestic violence, is never justified. But that's 55%. You'd want it to be higher, right? Um, and as I said, child marriage is definitely high in Bangladesh. So we have our challenges in terms of, of sort of the context and what we do. Um, so as you can see, some things changed, some things uh, didn't change. So how did this change happen? So let me take you back to 1970s. In 1973, so this is after independence. We gained our independence in 1971 in December. And um, then obviously 72 is quite chaotic because you're, it's post-war torn country. You're trying to put things together. In 73, you have the elections, you have a government, and it's trying to come up with the first five-year plan. So those of you who are thinking, what is FFYP? It's the first five-year plan. And if you analyze that document, uh, it talks about women's role as mothers particularly under education. So you want educated women because you want educated mothers. And then it talks about rehabilitation for survivors of rape during war. And that's the only two places where women are mentioned. Women are not mentioned anywhere else. It's the first five-year plan of the country. Uh, I have an interesting family story about that. So my father and uh, his colleagues, uh, a lot of them were his friends, so they're all my, if you know Bangladeshi culture, then they're all my chachus, or what it means is uncles. They were all part of forming this wonderful plan. And obviously, the plan came out. And then there was sort of a domestic dispute going on in all the academics who were involved in formulating this fantastic plan or working in the planning commission, because um, their wives, mostly who were also academics, were furious because they were like, where are the women? And uh, basically the answer was, but we don't have any statistics. How can we put you guys in? How can we even plan if there's no statistics? 
And I, uh, that sort of is the kind of the backstory of uh, how research on women got started by women academics because they suddenly realized that it doesn't matter how much you say that this is a justified thing to look at women's issues, you still need to provide data. And there wasn't data and the government wasn't really thinking about getting data because it just produced that kind of plan. Um, having said that, I mean, obviously that's the backstory and we are talking about it, but if you look at 1970s and if you look at all the different government's documents around the world, remember the first um, UN decade for women starts in 1975, the first women's conference, the World Women's Conference, and there were there was uh, Mexico, Copenhagen, Nairobi, and Beijing. Those of you familiar with uh, sort of uh, women in development stuff, you already know this. So Mexico happens in 1975. So the UN is asking for statistics from many countries. What's the condition of women? A lot of countries couldn't provide that because they didn't have statistics. So it's not unusual for Bangladesh, which has just come out of a war, to not have that much. If you look at the development literature and sort of um, how women are framed in that literature, a lot of the time they're framed as they're users of services, services that are provided, whether healthcare services, education, whatever it is. They're framed as economic agents. So in the credit literature, there's a lot of talk about women as economic agents. Um, they're also framed as, oh, they're part of the civil society. Uh, sometimes they're talked about as, oh, women also act as policymakers, particularly in Bangladesh. It's kind of hard to avoid given the number of women you have in politics. So you kind of have to talk about it if your prime minister is female because obviously she's the main decision maker. So you do frame it that way. Um, and as I said, there, there are lots of different types of government policies and uh, government actions, whether that was around family planning I was talking about or health or education uh, those helped to bring about this change, but there were also movements, uh, social movements, um, and then also service delivery by civil society organizations, so innovative models that were tested out. So the credit programs that you know about, that, that was initially tested by Grameen Bank or, um, or BRAC. Um, and you also had NGOs testing out other kinds of services, not just credit, but around provision of legal aid thinking about what if you can't address adult education through formal education system, then how do you do it well, through non-formal education? Or how do you get children who are hard, in hard to reach areas to school So if they can't have formal schooling? So there are different types of programs that sort of started focusing on how do you sort of get the society moving. Um, we are used to criticizing donors quite a lot in terms of them meddling in national agendas and generally a lot of donors do that and if you look at 70s and 80s history we all know that uh, you know um, foreign external powers weren't that great they meddled quite a bit in politics um, but in Bangladesh's case this is an interesting particularly if you look at gender and development agenda it's an uh, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting story partly because donors actually did do something here. They did take a risk. They did fund programs that were not necessarily going to be popular, but also like stuff that was needed that needed to be done. So shelter for women, anti-trafficking um, sort of uh, activities, violence against women. Um, sort of, for example, we had a have a form of violence which is called acid violence uh, or acid attack. So it's attack, a lot of the time women are victims of these particular types of incidents. So creating or funding activities, not just to raise awareness, but service provision for these specific survivors of this kind of horrendous attack. These were, you know, uh, working with us, not just in terms of HIV programs, but working with sex workers, sex workers rights programs. These were initially started off through donor funding, working along with rights-based organizations in, in the country. And that was a risk to take because not these programs, you don't know whether they would succeed. They're not always, you can't always show impact. A lot of the time we talk about donor funding and we say, well, what's the impact? How many did you save? What did you do? I mean, that's the predominant discourse these days against aid, that we can't see impact of the kind of changes we want to see. So, Think about that and think about the risk that you're taking funding programs that may not necessarily be pop popular, that may be controversial, that may be you're taking a risk that may not be successful. 
So in that sense, that's not, it's not a bad story if you, for the donors, or at least donors should have some good press somewhere. Um, but um, what is um, interesting is that in that story, in terms of analyzing the policy, analyzing what the NGOs did, analyzing what the donors did, people kind of forget about, well, what did the women do? And that's what I want to talk about, what, what did the women do? Because women did the heavy lifting, as they always do, right? So let's look at women as agents of change. Um, how am I doing for time? Oh, oh my God. Uh, so women as agents of change, in terms of uh, the history itself, uh, it's nothing near in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a very rich history of women participating in anti-colonial struggles, in social welfare activities, in economic entrepreneurship. Um, those of you who know about Rokea, so let me show you. That's her. That's Begum Rokea, and that's our, uh, if you think about Bangladeshi feminists, that's where we take our inspirations from. Um, those of you who unfortunately cannot read Bangla but can read English, this is one of her books. It's about uh, this, she imagines this land which is called, it's a feminist utopia, and uh, it's called Sultana's Dream. And it's quite an interesting story in terms of if you had a place where women ruled, what would it look like? And this was written in 1905, you know, so quite interesting. Um, you, we have had people who fought colonial powers. So if you think about Priti Lata or, or Ila Mitro or Kumudini Hajung, they're fighting British colonial powers. We have had women in social welfare, right? And um, basically, that tradition continued all throughout, and it's still continuing. And if you look at the struggle, it's not just the prominent leaders that I'm picking out, but you also have women who are struggling every day and advancing rights of women in the work that they do. So credit program that targeted women at a time when women don't inherit property, uh, women are not necessarily in the market, that you're being integrated. There's an instrumental logic behind why you're being targeted, partly if you talk to people who ran, ran these programs, is that um, basically women are within the household and they can't necessarily default on your loan because they can't run away like men. Um, but if you look at what they did with the money, what that money helped them in terms of decision making within the family, the fact that in a society where you have never handled cash, you're handling cash, the fact that you have credit group meetings and you're in, in a village where actually you just stayed within your neighborhood, you're going to the meetings. It may seem like a little thing for us because we take the tube and we travel and everything else, Think about that context and think about what that means. And there was a lot of resistance when the initially credit program started. It wasn't easy. And these women were branded in a particular way. They still took a chance to do that. Uh, think about the RNG workers, the ready-made garment workers. Uh, uh, there, a lot of them, when it started, were young girls, teenage girls, coming from the village, uh, taking up this job, never been to urban area, uh, probably has a sister or whoever and coming to stay with them. Um, sort of trying to negotiate. You negotiate with the family to say, I don't want to get married now. I'd like to work. Think about you're 15 and you're trying to negotiate that or you're running away to do it. Think about earning money. Yes, it's an exploitative work, but the money also gives you a kind of agency. And how does that change? Think about the fact that this was a country where you didn't see women workers going out in large numbers. And suddenly you see that in streets of Dhaka in the morning and in the evening time, large numbers of women in the public space. What does that mean? That does something. That changes something. Uh, think about women health workers. Remember that we talked about the family planning uh, program? Think about at a time when you didn't see women going to the villages, door to door, uh, sort of talking about contraception. And suddenly you're doing it. It may seem like a small thing. Think about the context and what does that mean? Initially, when they started doing it, it was, they weren't thought of as great women. But it happened. Things changed. And of course, you have the professional women that um, numbers have gone up in terms of women doctors, women lawyers, women as academics. Uh, Dhaka University, where I, I'm on leave from, that was established in 1921. We still have a law 
our rule in the statute which says that if a male student and a female student talks without uh, faculty being present, that you have to pay a fine. So that's still in the rule books. Um, nobody cares about it. There are so many female faculty to begin with. <laughs> You know, that it's, 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 it's a dramatic change if you think about the changes in, in that sense. So let me show you pictures of women. So this was, this was a contest we ran in terms of what are the pictures of, if you thought about women's empowerment, how would you see it? So this is a, a bangle seller on Taka Street in a public space hawking her, her stuff. This is a female mechanic. And as you know, mecha me you know mechanic's job is quite a male-dominated profession, and you see a girl doing it. This is obviously in the garment industry, and she's a female manager looking at things. Construction workers, again, in the public spaces. This is nighttime. Generally, uh, there is a strong <coughs> taboo against women being out in, in, at night, but you can see that she's a tea shop owner selling stuff. Um, some of you, those of you who are Bangladeshi, probably rec very well recognize her. She's a well-known journalist. That's her team, and she's on. Uh, she's a TV journalist, um, and uh, our female peacekeepers. So uh, we do participate in UN peacekeeping missions, and uh, she is one of the uh, one of the peacekeepers. Sort of had an. Um, there was a fantastic interview that she gave about what the job meant to her and sort of what were the challenges. And of course, you see collective struggles. So the top picture is 1971, uh, basically. And the bottom one is in 2011. But you do see women in, in the streets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about women's movement. Can you give me, Ed, can you let me know when I'm running out of time? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so with women's movement, and the, that quote is from a colleague of mine sort of saying that among all the different movements in Bangladesh, this is one of the most vibrant. And even though the size doesn't seem very big, it's like the tick of the back of an elephant with a very loud voice. And women's movement in Bangladesh does have a very loud voice. There are different types of organizations. You have activist organizations that are membership-based, mass organizations, or you have professional organizations like female lawyers organizations, you have policy and advocacy organizations, and you also have NGOs that are for women, run by women, or you have social movement organizations. And they they operate at different levels, a local level, national level, how they're formalized in terms of what their structures are, whether they have a governing body, whatever, it varies depending on, there are many different types. Uh, over the years, they have looked at many different issues, and as, as you can see, the list is crammed here, right? So in 1970s, it was around rehabilitation for the rape victims, but also around development initiatives were starting. As you can see, in by 1980s, they have started picking up rights-based issues, so around uh, violence against women, about having family courts for women to settle the different family disputes, about political participation of women, about changing uh, personal law, uh, by 1990s, obviously, the issues have added up. So, you know, they're talking about custodial violence, so violence in police custody. They're talking about reforming the family code. They're talking about, well, how is money being spent by the government? How do we track it? So there are specific ways of looking at gender budgets. They're talking about acid violence, the specific form of violence we talked about. They're talking about sexual harassment, uh, about minority women's rights in Bangladesh, trafficking, etc. And then from last decade, other issues have come in in terms of migration, domestic violence, uh, the particular policies that government have, um, a lot of different issues. And they employ many different types of strategies. So a lot of it is about how do you frame your demand. Remember, you're operating in a patriarchal context. Not everybody would like what you want to demand. Um, so a lot of my research is on women's movement, looking at their different strategies. So uh, one is sort of around CEDAW. I found it quite interesting because they were framing it as this is the Bill of Rights for women, you know, that, that kind of framing, and framing it around why is it a justice-based issue. Uh, there is also a lot of focus on conscientization, so around the, acid, the movement that was around addressing acid violence focused quite a lot on that, what's the impact of that violence. The fact that a lot of the time it was justified around, oh, the, the, the girls must have violated some kind of social norm. Um, that, oh, they had, uh, because a lot of the attacks were by um, boys or men who were romantically interested in the girls and the girls had refused them. Sort of saying that, you know, girls have a right to say no. 
And uh, it doesn't matter whether you had a previous relationship or whatever it is, you still have a right to say no to that, that nobody deserves this kind of attack. Um, it's not, I mean, it, when you're a movement itself, you need allies in different um, sort of spheres of the state and also the society. Uh, the media generally has been quite sympathetic. It's partly because a lot of the women's movement actors also have personal or informal connections uh, in the sense that, you know, you went to the same school or you went to the same university. So, you know, the editor, or, you know, the journalist, you can call them up and say, hey, we need this kind of. Um, and then also with state bureaucracy itself. So inside the bureaucracy, you do have sympathetic actors or used to have sympathetic actors that you had uh, linked with. And obviously, when you target the state, you don't just start target. State is not a monolithic block. You pick and choose which organ you want to target, who you want to target within that organization. And you use your informal networks. If you don't have the numbers, and if you can't be out in the street in millions, then you have to use those informal networks to get your agenda in, to get your foot in the door. But there's also other strategies in terms of creating spectacles to attract attention. So one of, one of the instances I'll talk about here briefly is, uh, which was about maternal mortality. So we have, uh, those of you who know Bangladesh's history know about the language movement in 1952, which is where then sort of the whole genesis for Bangladesh in terms of the cultural uh, sort of nationalism started. Uh, there is a memorial uh, commemorating the martyrs who had, uh, who had died. And, you know, for or who were shot by the police and who died. So th that place is uh, ha has a monument to commemorate them. So for maternal mortality, the way women's movement wanted to draw attention was that um, you had a candlelight vigil, you went to the martyrs' memorial, and it's it was a candle for each um, woman in that year who had died giving birth, and it was spectacular. And it drew attention to, to the issue. Uh, they do a lot of experiential workshop. So uh, for example, uh, public hearing on violence against women, uh, people talking about their experiences, what does that mean, experience of that kind of violence. Uh, they do a lot of national convention to establish their, uh, their expertise, uh, their coordinated demonstrations, so different types, right? Uh, there are also not just women's movement, but women are also in other social movements. So we talked about national movements and women being symbols in that. But there has been women's collective action. There's a tra rich tradition of that in terms of women being part of peasant movements. So some of you know about the Te Tebhaga movement, which happened um, quite a while ago. Uh, but you know, part of peasant movements, part of uh, sh commercial shrimp farming is very popular, but then that affects land in a particular way. So then women being part of that movement. There are movements around minority struggles, particularly in Chittagong Hill Tracks. So you have particular organizations that focus on uh, issues that women face in that particular area. Uh, women are part of labor movements and migration movements. Uh, the organization that I have there, BOMSA, is a, basically a, an organization that run, that's run by female um, migrants. You know. um, Obviously, there are many different types of challenges for a women's movement. Just because you're being very vibrant doesn't necessarily mean that you're always very effective. Um, and there are different types of challenges that come up. Um, as you saw, women's movement agenda grow throughout the different years. Obviously, you also had fragmentation in terms of what you think is the key issue and what should be the focus. A lot of the time, particularly in the 90s and last decade, the focus has been, can we change policy? and who do we know inside the state. But women's movement is not necessarily about policy change. It's also about changing minds. It's a social movement, right? So you also need uh, work there, you know, in terms of how do you change mindset? How do you change the culture? And there's been a little bit of a less focus on that recently. Uh, there's, all, of course, the challenge of NGOization of the movement itself. It's a particular term we feminists use, but it's partly because when you have a large NGO sector and we have the world's largest NGO sector, in terms of how you do movement then becomes the way NGOs do things. And social movements are not necessarily NGOs, but there has been an NGOization in terms of the modes of organizing, in terms of how you count success. There's of course also the challenge of are you on the wider political agenda 
And also, do you have younger people or new blood? And of course, there's the whole issue about intersectionality in terms of is there a middle class bias? Are minority issues clearly represented? Uh, so there are different types of challenges. Um, apart from the challenges that are internal to the movement itself, there are challenges that are external. So in terms of do you have access to political spaces, and I don't mean policy spaces, I mean political parties. Uh, women's uh, rights issues aren't necessarily popular with political parties. This is not something that happens in Bangladesh. It's not anywhere in the world, really. It doesn't get you votes uh, most of the time. So it becomes difficult. You may have allies within the state. You may be vibrant in the civil society, but you also want in a democracy, where do agendas come from? It comes through political parties. That's how you debate. And if you're not on the agenda, how do you get on the agenda? So in a sense, that's a very big challenge. We have cha seen changes in the way discourses are framed, so policy discourse, how you make demands, how things are reported in the media, and we have seen policy change. But adoption of policies is not enough. You want them implemented. Some policies, of course, are successfully in implemented in the way I talked about, uh, you know, population policies for, uh, you know, health, education, etc. But some policies are difficult in terms of violence against women. You know, how do you, you know, you, you saw the numbers. Um, of course, then there's the issue about if you're not really interacting with the political parties or if you're afraid of being co-opted by political parties, then where do you go? How much influence can you have? Um, how do you get, if you're vibrant in the civil society, how do you get other civil society actors to be involved in your agenda? So it's not just women's agenda and women just doing, um, working on women's rights. Um, and this is the last slide, so Ed. Um, it's basically, apart from the external challenges that women's movement face, there's also the challenge uh, that is created by the wider shifts, wider economic and political shifts, both nationally and internationally. So what happens in the global policy spaces affects Bangladeshi women, whether that's about ready-made garment sector, whether that is about uh, shrimps, whether that is about migration, because we do send quite a bit of female uh, laborers uh, who are blue collar workers to different countries. So when these global policies are made or debated or framed, who channels our voices? Uh, that's a tough thing. Of course, you all know about Rana Plaza and the collapse of the plaza, and there is this whole big thing about accord and alliance and European uh, sort of powers coming in and talking about, well, how it needs to be reformed. And you also had the US-led alliance talking about things. But, you know, you can talk all you want. And you can talk about how the labor is exploitative and everything else. But what are you willing to do as consumers? Are you willing to take the hit? Because, you know, rights cost money. Where's the money going to come from? And you can say, well, why aren't the business owners doing this? You think businesses just do things? They don't. Um, there's a whole issue about care economy, so women's unpaid care work burden, the child care, the elderly care, everything that you depend on. You do want women in the labor market coming through, and you see the numbers are rising, but that also means that what do we have in place for child care and elderly care and all the kinds of programs that you see in developed countries, and can we afford that? And if you can't afford that, then what is the alternate? Because it's, the alternate cannot be that women can't go to work. You know, that's, that cannot be the alternate. Uh, there is a challenge of violence against women in the public space, which is rising. Um, and sort of how do you address that? You know, because if you do want women outside working or in politics or in the public spheres, you do need to address harassment issues. And this is not necessarily just something Bangladesh faces. This is something that's faced everywhere, let's face it. Uh, climate change, again, is a big challenge. Bangladesh is facing environmental challenges in a large, in a big way. Um, what is, that has specific gender implications in terms of livelihoods changing, in terms of migration happening in a particular way. Um, it's affecting families and it's affecting women. Um, and you also have natural disasters happening at a rapid, more frequent manner. So again, global policy spaces and climate debates uh, where are our voices? We are a tiny country, right? Uh, we need our allies. 
And it's not just talking about um, sort of policies, but you need, when you talk about policies and when you talk about this convention, you also need to put on that gender lens, which a lot of the time is missing from these debates. It's not there. And of course, the perennial challenge that we have around family laws, because we are not equal in private. So we have lots of challenges. So when I said contentious empowerment, that's why I said it's contentious, because we have overcome the first generation of challenges, but we need to overcome quite a lot more. Um, are, do women have the kind of strength that's needed? I think so, we have come this far, but we need a lot more different allies and um, a lot more sympathetic actors at different levels. And hopefully it's there because we can do miracle. Thank you so much. So, Professor Nazanin, thank you very much for a, a compelling, uh, enthusiastic, and in my view, convincing lecture. Uh, you reminded us in a timely fashion, as it's International Women's Day tomorrow, about the classificatory practices and counting practices of states and international organizations and the effects that those sorts of things have. You also talked about, I think very importantly, the ways in which social change does or does not happen through agency and the interaction of different kinds of people. I think they're very important lessons to bring into this forum. Uh, and I thank you very much for delivering the lecture. Uh, just before I pass on to the vote of thanks, I'd like to say just one other thing about the spirit of the partnership between the SOAS South Asia Institute and the 7th of March Foundation. Uh, last year, for the first lecture in the series, which was scheduled for the 7th of March, um, we had industrial action on our campus um, due to a pension dispute, and we all agreed that the 7th of March foundation lecture should be moved until April uh, in order to respect the picket lines that were around SOAS at the time. And that I think was a very important moment of solidarity between us and the 7th of March Foundation which brought us together in a very uh, different kind of industrial dispute. Very important for us and I think very uh, respectful of my colleagues in the 7th of March Foundation who really were quite keen on Brick Lane getting into Bloomsbury as soon as possible, but they kindly delayed uh, in respect for our industrial action. So finally, I'd like to uh, invite my colleague from the 7th of March Foundation, Nuruddin Ahmed, uh, to, invite, to, to present the final vote of thanks. And after the vote of thanks, we will go to a reception in the other building. So thank you. Uh, <coughs> Thanks, Ed. Uh, yes, I think we made fast move last year from Brooklyn to Bloomsbury. We are here to, again this year. Hopefully, you have to put up with for future minimally years too. Okay. So I think I have only one job to do: to, to thank everyone for attending. But it's quite difficult listening to someone like Professor Nazni. Where do you start? Who do you think first? Right? But I think the listening to her speech, because we are not quite sure what topic to choose, because this is our, our second, second lecture. Then we thought in two years' time, Bangladesh will be celebrating gold degree of its independence. And we cannot, there cannot be any better topic than talk about the population almost 50% is it or something like that. What is the position of that? What, because one of the ideas of Bangladesh was to create opportunities for everyone, fairer society. Because Professor Nadine say mentioned about 7th March speech. And that March speech, if you look into it, one of the most important words Sheikh Mujibur Rahman has used, emancipation. And he qualified that what is economic, social, cultural emancipation. And that's why we thought this is it. Listening to this was so eloquent, so uh, informative. Therefore, I think 
uh, and ov obviously we saw different of this year's speech is that women were not looked at just stereotypical, but women being in the driving force, in the agent for change. That's what she, she has highlighted. Bangladesh has made lots of progress, but there are a lot to be done. That's what we have learned in the world. So I think I would like everyone to join uh, thanking Professor Nazneen for such a beautiful, eloquent delivery of lecture. I, I, I cannot finish uh, without thinking and so, someone else. How did we get to do, reach Dr. Nazim? Right? The finding Dr. Nazim was a challenge itself. And we, we spent many months trying to search for the right speaker. So therefore, I would like to give one of the biggest thanks to uh, Professor Edward Simpson for finding uh, <laughs> okay? and, and finally, I won't go on to listing all my colleagues, but I think I would like to mention for his hard work. He worked tireless last week, and he was telling that I'm ready for next year's work. And so therefore, very big thanks to uh, Sunil Poon of the Institute of South East Asia. And, and my colleague, Ansar Adai Box Choudhury, who also continued to provide support for the foundation. But lastly, but not least, all thanks go to you for turning up, making this uh, event a very successful. You've been a wonderful audience. Okay, thank you.